Her name is Emin Sharqawi. I am the director of the Hassan II International Center for Environmental Training, as well as regional facilitator, major group of stakeholders Africa. And I'm also the deputy chair of the IUCN Work Commission on Environmental Law. This event is co-organized by said commission and the center, which is the academic arm of the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection. The program is quite dense, so we have to move uh, in a very uh, efficient manner. Uh, Mr. McGuinness will be providing keynote remarks, but in the interest of uh, optimal uh, arrangement uh, to make sure that other activities that are taking place here uh, take place swimmingly, I would like to ask for his understanding and first give the floor to Mr. David Dumbisi, who's program officer at the Civil Society Unit in the Governance Affairs Office at the United Nations Environment Program. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Oh, and sorry, very quickly, for those of you attending online, live translation is provided, English, French, and Arabic. Thank you. We can swap seats, David. Okay. Everything is refusing to come use this now. I thank you very much, Ayman, and uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, colleagues and uh, friends. Uh, as you've been told, my name is David Ombisi. I'm from the Civil Society Unit uh, Governance Affairs Office uh, here in UNEP. And uh, I'm stepping in for a colleague of mine, Sam Barat from. Uh, Ecosystem Division, Environmental Education, uh, um, uh, who was supposed to be a part of this panel, but uh, is unable because of other uh, commitments. Um, I understand my brief or our brief was uh, basically to make an intervention with regard to looking at how formal and informal uh, education initiatives uh, can contribute to biodiversity uh, conservation. Um, but first of all, just as a matter of uh, introduction and just putting everything in perspective, uh, we all agree that uh, human activities continue to put a lot of pressure on natural ecosystems, uh, basically, um, and therefore understanding the importance of biodiversity and uh, its con conservation becomes uh, quite vital. Uh, so if we go back in history and looking at the United Nations uh, Conference on Environment in 1992, it does recognize also uh, education as critical for achieving environmental and ethical awareness and for effective public participation, uh, particularly with regard to decision making. And also when you look at uh, some of the most recent uh, uh, pronouncements and some of the most recent blueprints, uh, they also uh, put emphasis uh, in terms of environmental education uh, being useful uh, in supporting uh, the world to cope with the different environmental challenges that we continue to, uh, to encounter. And therefore environmental education, be it formal or informal, uh, really plays a crucial role in promoting the conservation of biodiversity. Uh, and it is an important factor, uh, basically, in shaping people's knowledge and attitudes uh, towards uh, biodiversity conservation. Now, in terms of uh, some of, uh, you know, initiatives that are related to that, um, you know, in, in the uh, space of either formal or, uh, or informal education, I'll give a, a few examples, but in the context of... Um, one, the cooperation that uh, UNEP uh, has established with the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Prote Protection based in Morocco, for which uh, Ayman is coming from. And uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, UNEP is a partner uh, through an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, that was uh, uh, agreed some time back. Uh, UNEP is a partner uh, of the African Green University and Youth Education Network, uh, which of course is hosted by uh, Mohammed VI Foundation uh, for Environmental Protection. 
And together, uh, we've been working on greening campuses and uh, implementing environmental and sustainable practices. Uh, of course, UNEP values uh, the great work of the network, uh, the work that is being done by the network, uh, where we have about nine, 29 members uh, and they're able to share best practices. They're able to benefit from resources and trainings uh, to further promote sustainable development, but of course, specifically also looking at uh, biodiversity conservation. So as UNEP, of course, we are still excited to do more work with the network, uh, focusing on creating more green skills for youth uh, to restore and conserve nature through formal education, uh, integrating more universities in Africa uh, in the ne Nature Positive Network, and through non-formal education as well to expand the outreach of youth uh, acting for nature through sports. We do also have another initiative, uh, what we call the Sports for Nature, uh, this is an initiative that is uh, supported by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, uh, the International Olympic Committee, uh, UNEP, of course, and the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, which was launched in December 2022. And this is really to help in terms of providing a pathway for sports uh, to accelerate their action for nature. So, you know, using sports to... Uh, promote um, uh, education and to promote nature conservation. So the initiative offers, offers sports of all sizes and in all you know uh, regions, technical assistance and training, as well as a platform uh, for exchange of ideas uh, between peers. Uh, currently, uh, I think there are 53 signatories, uh, which uh, regularly report on how they are embedding nature in their sustainability strategies and calling for further guidance uh, in terms of contributing to global biodiversity goals. One more initiative uh, is uh, what we call Nature Positive Universities. Uh, and this is supported by Oxford University, of course, in partnership with UNEP, uh, where we have uh, in a global community more than 500 uh, higher education institutions that continue to promote uh, 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 nature in terms of um, on their campuses, in supply chains, and within the communities, working with the communities to uh, better promote understanding of nature conservation. Uh, finally, we have uh, the Green Jobs for Youth Pact. Uh, this is a collaboration uh, with uh, between UNEP, ILO, and UNICEF. Uh, to promote green jobs for young people around the world and support a just and equitable uh, transition uh, into a low carbon circular economy. Uh, and the three UN agencies are working with governments, social partners, employers, workers, organizations, education entities, including universities and the private sector to create um, more new green jobs and assist in greening uh, the existing jobs as well and enable young uh, green entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs to start sustainable businesses. So with this, our focus of course, is reinforcing green skills in the restoration and conservation area, uh, which is a priority uh, focusing on higher education, um, informal education uh, to basically deliver uh, a workforce that really understands uh, the benefits and the importance of biodiversity. So as I conclude there, therefore, uh, what we are trying to say is that by incorporating environmental education into either formal or informal learning settings, we can create uh, a more environmentally conscious society that really values and protects uh, the remarkable diversity of life uh, that we continue to enjoy on Earth. So I just wanted to share some of those um, uh, initiatives uh, that we've been working on, particularly also with the Mohammed VI Foundation uh, in the context of how the formal and informal education uh, can you know, contribute towards uh, biodiversity conservation. So thank you very much, uh, thank you. Chair. Back to you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for uh, making the time uh, to share with us your perspective. It is much appreciated and uh, we know how busy you are and we strongly appreciate and I'm speaking, the we includes both the foundation, but also ourselves as uh, MGFC, uh, your engagement and support. Thank you very much, uh, David. I'm now happy to give the floor to Mr. McGuinness Stewart, who's Deputy Director General at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, who in charge of programs. Uh, I think he has a PowerPoint. If uh, my colleagues, yes, I think this is it. And uh, we'll be changing slides upon his instruction as he goes forward. Thank you very much. Okay. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Eamon. Uh, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I am. Um, I'll skip, uh, I'll skip the introductions of who I am, as uh, Emmons already said, and maybe just jump straight into, into the presentation, given that we're running a little bit uh, behind time. So uh, basically, what I, uh, looking at the theme of this side event, what I wanted to do was to actually talk about what has been developed up as an operational framework and is gaining actually quite a lot of momentum, notwithstanding maybe the little bit of disappointment that we didn't see this move this forward to a, to a, to a resolution uh, this week in, in UNEA. But nature-based solutions, and really to give you a bit of an understanding of how that's been uh, framed and and why I do think it actually is a very a very effective mechanism for, uh, for, for delivering on nature's blueprint, specifically on how we can, in a non-exploitative, um, and I would also add non-instrumental uh, or non-instrumentalist type approach really make effect of nature in solving many of the, the challenges that we have as society. Um, and obviously this is work that many, uh, many organizations have been involved in. My own has been working with uh, my own being the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So not just the secretariat that I belong to, but the commissions uh, that uh, Eamon belongs to, several of them, and indeed many of our members. So to, with that, and again, apologies, the uh, seems to be a bit of overrun on the slide and the type. Basically, there has been, uh, the, the uh, I think the point of this slide is to show that there has actually been a lot done. There has been a lot of progress over the last, um, uh, really over, I'd say, the last 15 years. This started off, the idea came um, really around the mid 2000s um, of how we could actually start to package different types of approaches in under a consistent and coherent framework um, that particularly um, decision makers outside the conservation sector could understand rather than being told um, ecosystem-based uh, disaster risk reduction here, um, a, a climate adaptation there, agroforestry somewhere else, to be able to say all these are actually, they all rely on healthy functional ecosystems and ecosystem services and they, uh, and they are framed under nature-based solutions. There's just two points I'll mention here on this slide to say, so there's been a progress and really up, up until about 2016, there was, as I said, IUCN and, and uh, as, a, as a union have been doing some work on this, but it's really taken off from that point. We, in 2016, we identified uh, 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 the, the union, agreed a definition, which then moved and became the basis of UNEA. 5.5 five definition, which I think is a very nice example of how the ideas harmonize and don't diverge because the worst thing we can have is when ideas and concepts start to diverge rather than mutually reinforce themselves. So I really want to, to highlight the role that UNEA 5.5 five played in this and of course our colleagues in UNEP as well. The other point that I'd like to make from this slide is as a very important one, the early origins of um, of nature-based solutions. IUCN is very happy that we worked on this, but I want to be very clear, we did not create it. All we did, as I'd like to say, is we described it. We described it from practices, traditional practices that go back, uh, in many cases, millennia, that these are, the, this, the, the, this is as much rooted in the traditional knowledge and as it is 
in a conservation and natural resource science. So it's really sort of trying to uh, say, so that's, that's why I, I make this point of, it's a description of, and, and I'm trying to put this in a framework that actually then we can then start to use in our own processes, be they international, be they national, be they subnational, so that we can uh, to, to move forward in a coherent way. Next slide, please. And so I'll just, uh, I, I've mentioned, uh, next slide, please. Um, and again, just for those of you who maybe um, aren't familiar, or just need a little bit of a reminder. This is the UNEA 5.5 definition. It said came, it was, it was adapted and, 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 and uh, strengthened uh, uh, from the original IUCN definition. Um, but very much it is absolutely the same thing. There was no divergence in what the intent was. And I'll just highlight, as you can see in bold there, a couple of things. Number one, it's actions. It's not about designations of particular types of landscapes or uses. It's actions. There has to be a positive action moving forward on that. It also requires ecosystems. It needs healthy or restoring ecosystems, delivering ecosystem services that actually can be channeled to help address uh, the challenges that we face as society. It could be water security, it could be adaption to climate change, it could be disaster disaster risk reduction. And there's a there, there is a there's a there's a sort of double test in there. It's got to be doing good for human well-being and it's got to be delivering biodiversity benefits. And I would just add on this issue of delivering by, by this is why I mentioned right at the start about the importance that it's non-exploitative. And that's non-exploitative because we don't want to undermine biodiversity, but also it would be a nonsense if we deploy nature-based solutions and then we undermine the very asset that is delivering that solution. So it ha next slide, please. It has a common de it has a common origin, a common foundation, let's say, with what one might consider more conventional approaches to conservation, uh, safeguarding nature, but it actually has a, a, a distinct approach. So basically, and I, by that I mean that uh, actions that, that, that there is nothing uh, contradictory, between safeguarding nature and safeguarding society using nature-based solutions. But the approach, and if you would like, if we can maybe for a minute use corp corporate language, the KPI is somewhat different in that with safeguarding nature, we want to see biodiversity benefits. We want to see the inherent values of nature protected. With safeguarding society, we want to see more resilient societies, more uh, access to water, et cetera. It's got a couple of implications there for it. it means that not all conservation actions are MBS. There are some protected areas, for example, let me take protected areas. Some protected areas will definitely be an MBS. They may protect a watershed, but other ones are just safeguarding nature. So I think that's the first thing. The, one of the other things I quite like about this is that there's an emphasis on biodiversity abundance rather than biodiversity rarity. Often in conservation, we're, we're look, chasing after protecting rare species or rare ecosystems. But here what you need is you need abundance of biodiversity to be able to deliver those benefits. And the very final thing is because this is about delivering benefits in real places, it needs to be aligned with the local context and circumstances. And I'll come to that in a little bit more. Next slide, please. Oh, fair up. Okay, uh, the one one myth I would one bubble I would like to burst or myth I would like to burst is there seems to be sometimes this equa equating of nature based solutions is all about voluntary carbon markets and so I really want to put on the table here no it is not there are benefits there are there are opportunities to sequester carbon. Uh, clearly, and uh, the very good study from the University of Oxford showed that if Brazil implemented its forest code, it could hit its uh, the ambition of this NDC. So, of course, nature sequesters carbon, but this is not about facilitating voluntary carbon markets. And that, if you just uh, I say, I won't go through all those, but this is what nature-based solutions about. It's as much about human health, 
as much about water security. And in fact, a lot of the work we do, uh, and for speaking in IUCN and I think with the commissions, a lot of the work we do in climate change is about adaptation, actually, and greater resilience to local livelihoods. Next slide, please. And basically, I think one of the real key elements is that we really, this does need to be dealt with at scale, or at least a perception of, we're dealing with ecosystems, they do not fit into neat little boundaries, therefore there is a, a implementation of scale uh, is important. And there is, we have got some very good examples of where, of how that has worked in, in practice. Um, I'm, uh, um, I'm, very happy that I am old enough not only to be involved with nature-based solutions, but also to be involved with the concept of forest landscape restoration that we started uh, at the turn of the century. And that really was about actually using and restoring forest landscape up and forest landscape functionality to for real benefits. And there we've got a real proof of concept of how this works in practice. Uh, just uh, and these figures I, I, are now out of date. They're a couple of years old. But there's something like 50 million hectares recorded under restoration, a third of a million jobs created for both uh, women and men, and a lot of the work being done through a range of landscapes, not just in, in intact or natural ecosystems, but on agricultural and agroforestry landscapes. Next slide, please. So one of the things is how do we take a, an approach then to apply this in a consistent manner? And that's uh, several years ago, just um, about 2018, IUCN and the commissions in particular, I want to note the Commission on Ecosystem Management, pulled together, ran a, a very detailed process, reached out and came up with eight criteria and 28 indicators of how nature-based solutions could be delivered. I will highlight that this is not a prescriptive standard, it's the opposite. It's a facilitatory standard. It's not meant to be mandatory, it's meant to be voluntary. And it's meant to give a framework that then we can then translate into appropriate guidance at the local and national level, for uh, but in a coherent and consistent way, so that we are comparing, for examples, apples with apples, whether we're working in South Africa or Morocco, yeah, that, that sort of thing. Um, the, uh, widely consulted, including actually with some very specific consultations, for example, with uh, Indigenous peoples, um, and we got about uh, we had about 800 experts engaged in this from 100 countries, and we really fought, tried to follow the, uh, the 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 best practice guidance on how one establishes a standard, and that that uh, including that it's reviewed every four years, and that review process will be coming up very soon. Uh, again, as I said, it is facilitatory and it is voluntary. Um, and the idea is then that it is translated down to appropriate national or local contexts and circumstances. Next slide, please. I won't go through this in detail, but just to say these are the these are the eight criteria, and it's it, in many ways they sort of make good sense that we need. Uh, for example, I'll just call out a couple here. Uh, criteria number three that it has to result in net gain for biodiversity and ecosystem integrity. The reason for that is, of course, we don't want to undermine biodiversity, but equally, we don't want to undermine the source of the ecosystem services that deliver the benefits. Five, that it has to be, uh, and again, I, I, to this audience, I don't need to under stress why this is so important. It has to be based on inclusive, transparent, and empowering governance processes. I would, and when you drill down into these and look at the indicators, that emphasizes not only protection of rights and safeguarding of rights, but the recognition of agency of local communities and tapping in and supporting that agency to deliver. Um, maybe the um, one that came up actually that got that was actually quite unique when we flagged it up was recognizing recognizing that there are trade offs, which is. Um, Many of us know this already. You, there is no such thing as win, 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 win. There has to be at some point you have to make decisions. How you make those decisions and how you uh, calculate the trade-offs, 
how you negotiate the trade-offs critically, how do we make sure we don't keep making the same trade-off time and time again so that you lose ecosystem functions at the landscape. All that is wrapped in there. And maybe um, uh, this number seven, we need, <clears throat> we need adaptive management. We're working with ecosystems. And finally, at this point, I've made that it needs to be mainstreamed within appropriate jurisdictional context. And I would really highlight, therefore, the importance of environmental law and policy and regulatory frameworks, and partly making sure that we get coherent policies so that, let's say, agriculture and environmental policies aren't undermining each other. Am I going too long? Okay, okay. I'll wrap up very soon. Next slide, please. I'll go very quick. Just for you to know, this is online. There is a self-assessment toolkit. We've, re we've got a community of practice, about 2,500 who use that. That is just one example. Uh, and it, 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 again, I said, it's facilitatory, it gives guidance. It's not, uh, but basically you can see that Criterion 5, uh, five on, on inclusive, transparent and empowering governance processes, the first indicator, making sure that there is a fully agreed uh, grievance mechanism, and then there are measures of how that can be assessed, if that's in place or not. And I say that, the, the other thing is that can then be translated into what is appropriate nationally, yeah? So this is, a, so, we, so we've got that, this self-assessment toolkit is online. It's there to be used. Um, we've, we reckon we've got about 10,000 users and there's a community of practice of about 2,500 behind it. I should also say that the standard is now translated into 22 languages, including all UN, all the six UN languages. And uh, this year, there will be another nine Asian languages added to that as well. Next slide. Just very quickly to say that the, 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 the integrity of the standard is safeguarded. It isn't uh, overseen by people uh, by the IUCN secretary or even our colleagues in the in the commissions. There is an independent standards committee that actually draws uh, from different parts of society, globally representative, that actually tries to maintain that. And uh, finally, last slide is another process I'll just highlight that was launched in uh, at COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh is an act enabling nature-based solutions to accelerate climate transformation, which is really trying to pull and get best practice. There is a global report we'll be launching tomorrow and really trying to identify what, what is moving ahead. And really, maybe just to conclude, how we use this effective, how we use nature's blueprints effectively for climate resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart, for uh, sharing a keynote that is very much in the spirit of today's event, harnessing natural solutions for climate resilience and, and clear uh, science-based rigorous approach to doing so. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, we'll now move to a presentation um, with two different perspectives on the IPES and IPCC joint report on biodiversity and climate change. First, we'll hear online from Dr. Michel Lim, who's the deputy chair of the IUCN WCR Biodiversity Law Specialist Group, also associate professor of law at the Yung Pong Hao School of Law, Singapore Management University. And here with me in the room, very happy to have Philip Osano, director for the African Center at the Stockholm Environment Institute. I need to indicate for the sake of um, Michel, because I think Philip might have caught a glimpse of him, that the Secretary General of the IPCC is coming in and out of the room. So just for your information, <laughs> thank you very much. Let's, let's go online to Michel. Habari zamchana, nina wa salamia sana sana. I would love to be in Nairobi with all of you. But uh, shukran laka to Ayman Shakawi and Kauta Kaidi for allowing me to join online. And as the slide indicates, I will be talking about the legal implications of the joint report between the IPBES and IPCC. And you might like to Google it while you're there. And when you get even to the preface of the report itself, you will see it's essentially talking about all the things I want to highlight. I was involved in the other part of the authorship, but it was the higher ups and the leaders of this report that wrote the preface. I had no part in writing the preface, which already states that climate change and biodiversity loss are the two most pressing issues of the Anthropocene. And as we've already started to hear from Stuart, and this is all in the first paragraph of the 
purpose itself, recognizing that in policymaking circles and in law, there is this siloed approach, this fragmentation between what's being done in the Convention on Biological Diversity on the one hand and the UNFCCC on the other. And so if you take nothing else away from what I'm about to say, it's these three points. Number one, that nature is not just a carbon sequestration regime, uh, not just a climate sequestration machine, and that there's this need to move beyond instrumentalization in the climate law regime. But importantly, for all of these to happen, there needs to be fundamental value change. And it's wonderful to see the synergies between what I'm about to talk about, the findings of the IPBES IPCC report, and that which is already being done by the IUCN in what Stuart has highlighted. That is, the report quite naturally, you would expect is talking about interconnections between biodiversity on the one hand and climate on the other. Importantly, what it stresses is that human futures need to be considered in connection as well. And failure to do so means that you fall into this um, lack of considering the perverse outcomes and consequences of these obviously interconnected social ecological systems. So moving to some of the key findings of the report itself. We know, and the report emphasizes the important role of ecosystems, of nature, of biodiversity in adaptation. And importantly, its role in, mitigate, in mitigation. We know how important tropical forests are as carbon sinks. But what to me is important is how the report also highlights that savannas, grasslands, peatlands, all the ecosystems that we sometimes might forget about also have this critical role in sequestration. And did you know that mangrove systems, I did not know this until the report came out and I found this out while working with the scientists on the report, mangroves can sequester four times as much carbon as tropical forests, as well as their very well known adaptation role as well, particularly when it comes to disaster management. And let's also not forget about the role of oceans as a climate sink. At the same time, the report emphasizes that by the end of the century, climate change is projected to be the number one cause of biodiversity loss. And so some of you might be thinking, okay, all we need to do is deal with climate change, biodiversity sorted at the same time. Well, Another key message of the report is why that might not be such a good idea. And that is because sometimes initiatives to address climate are not necessarily good for nature, not necessarily, not necessarily good for people. And that includes the range of mining, land use change that are associated with creating renewable energy, as well as and that's a mitigation side, as well as the ecosystem impacts, biodiversity impacts of large dams involved in adaptation. And also, not every nature-based solution, not every planting is a nature-based solution. We're familiar with the growing of biofuel crops, which not only has the capacity to destroy existing ecosystems, but has flow on food security impacts as well. And this paper here published in no less than the journal Science just last week in the context of the continent of Africa finds that a lot of the tree planting programs, the reforestation programs have occurred in systems which don't have naturally occurring forests. So your moving away from intact functioning ecosystems, which with their range of sequestration and range of other biodiversity benefits to forests that might not even have native species in those forests. So that need to back to the point that was made earlier that not every planting is a nature-based solution. So what needs to be done to deal with climate, nature, and people 
together. And the report emphasizes how nature is so wonderful, so amazing, so awe-inspiring, but it cannot do any everything. As you can see, well, a bit of nature in the picture there, nature's tired. And so part of what myself and my good friend Paul Gavin have explored in a recent chapter is the way in which climate, the climate law regime sometimes takes a far too instrumental approach to thinking about nature and ecosystems, very much as the role that nature can play in dealing with the climate issue, rather than the range of other ways in which why biodiversity nature is so important. If we look, for example, at the Paris Agreement in Article 5, the recognition of sinks, and with the much uh, maligned term when it comes to international lawyers, the word should instead of shall when it comes to sinks, even then, Biodiversity doesn't, doesn't appear in Article 5. Yes, there's a reference to forests, but there's this focus on sinks as a tool to sequester carbon and not sufficiently embracing the role of nature itself. Similarly, Article 7 that deals with adaptation doesn't, to my mind, sufficiently address and appreciate the range of adaptation capacities of ecosystems. And if we move to target eight of the global biodiversity framework, those of you familiar with the framework would know it as target eight as the um, climate change target. There we're seeing perhaps the attempt to engage with the range of other values of nature and to bring that into a uh, way of conversation with the UNFCCC related instruments, but a lot more needs to be done. And so in terms of the ways forward articulated by the IPBES IPCC report, number one, the number one priority of the report is to protect and restore carbon and species rich ecosystems, keeping intact functioning ecosystems as they are, not replacing them to plant all sorts of other trees in order to sequester carbon. And importantly, back to the point that nature does so much, but we need to do something too. We need to be part of rapid and ambitious emissions reductions and eliminate subsidies that are harmful to biodiversity and also engage in sustainable agricultural and forestry practices and changing diets, particularly in rich countries. But ultimately, underpinning all of this is the importance of fundamental value change and of just transitions to that system change. So coming back to the points being made at the start, let's start with the one on the end. We need to think about nature as so much more than this thing that humans can use to save us from ourselves. Recognizing the relational values of nature, the instrumental values of nature, of how there are interactions between humans, between climate, between nature, and there are, in some circumstances, uh, recognizing Stuart's point about win-win-wins, but they, it's important to recognize where there are circumstances of win-win-win across each of those and being very clear that it's not always going to be a win-win-win. And there needs to be a transformation of the fundamental values that underpin each of this. Nature is not just a machine for sequestering carbon and importantly, a shift in narrative, a shift in values as part of the climate related regimes as well would be very helpful to help give effect to some of the key messages coming out of the IPBES IPCC report. Asante Nisan. Thank you very much. And I'm quite excited to hear uh, Philip's uh, perspective on this important um, uh, approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ayman, and, and thank you, Michelle. I think. I'm... Okay. 
<laughs> it's done. Yeah, so I'll I'll pick up from where I'm, um, uh, Michelle has left. So my name is Philip Osana. I work at the Stockholm Environment Institute. I basically have three points uh, which I wanted us to reflect on. Uh, I start from where Michelle has left because I'm one of the authors of the IPBS Global Assessment Report. I was uh, in Chapter 4, which is Nature's Benefit to Society. Uh, and I start from there because I think we know when you look at the drivers of um, biodiversity laws, we know that climate change is one of the major drivers for biodiversity laws. We also know that there's changes within our land use and, and seascape, uh, which are driven by activities um, that are economic in nature, so mining, agriculture, and so on. So the first question um, is for us, for me, the first point is to really go back to the basics, which is um, the CBD, the Convention of Biodiversity, um, you know, the three objectives of the CBD, uh, conservation, which we, we do, we are doing uh, not so well, but at least we are doing. Uh, just to point out that from the IPBS work, um, one of the things that came out uh, very strongly is the role of indigenous and local communities. I, I bring that up because equity um, becomes a very central part of what I want to speak to. Uh, number two, um, I have the privilege the last uh, three years to work with uh, a British economist, uh, Professor Pathadas Gupta, who some of you might know published a study on the economics of climate, uh, economics of biodiversity. Um, and, and the fundamental point from that report uh, is the fact that we need to change our measures of success. And I think for me, that's my key message today, uh, because all countries in the world, all companies are racing to the bottom line and the way they're measuring success, the indicators for measuring success are indicators that does not signal to us when we are uh, destroying our biodiversity. So basically we are having economic growth at the cost of uh, degradation, <laughs> degradation of our nation, national uh, natural capital, which is what the Gupta brings, the concept of natural capital. Um, and I think the what we need to do now is to move towards a system of measurements of economic progress that take into account uh, the impact, particularly the negative impact of nature. And most of you, of course, know that the UN uh, Statistical Agency has now adopted a new framework uh, for an integrated uh, environmental economic uh, uh, indicators that then would also take into account ecological integrity and, and, and things like that. I think that to demonstrate the practical work of that, um, institutions like the World Bank now have natural capital accounts. Uh, they're supporting countries to develop natural capital accounts so that countries can actually even know what stock of biodiversity they have. Um, uh, but for me, this is very important because one of the reasons I got into this is the fact that uh, at one point during my graduate studies, I had a professor who did a study published in, in science uh, paper. Those of you who are scientists know that's very important. And, and basically it was looking at the cost and benefits of uh, biodiversity conservation. And his conclusion was, was not surprising. It was that it is cheaper to conserve biodiversity in the tropical countries. Um, and that's, of course, also where we have the largest uh, diversity, you know, bi biological diversity. But then I just asked and said, okay, uh, suppose we were to assume everybody in the world must have an equal level of standard of living. Would that conclusion hold? And of course it can't hold. And I think that's the mistake we are making right now. If you look at the work and the conversation we've had on the on the economics of biodiversity, you take for Africa, for instance, which has now the youngest population in the world, average income of an African uh, person is about uh, US dollars 3,000 or 4,000 on purchasing power parity equivalent. Uh, the global average is 17,000. If the objective of government in Africa is to increase the standard of living of the population in Africa to 17,000 US dollars, uh, do you think nature will survive, given what we know right now with deforestation and biodiversity laws and pressures on protected areas? But that's the, unfortunately, that's the part that we're not answering because we want to assume that, you know, we want to maintain biodiversity, but we don't want to think about uh, what is what is what are we going to do about populations in the world that are actually really extremely underprivileged, that are actually at the same time bearing the largest brunt of climate change. And lastly, I just wanted to say that. Um, uh, one of the other positive things that has come from this, we see a lot of movements towards adoption of bioeconomy. Uh, the EU was the first region in the world to adopt a bioeconomy strategy. Uh, I, I just want to say that within East Africa, the East Africa community, which comprises seven countries, has recently adopted uh, 
uh, a bioeconomy strategy that's actually also helping how can we make sure that there's a sustainable use of biodiversity and there could be example i can give but i think i'll stop it there just in terms of my three points thank you emma Thank you very much. And I'm happy that the two presentations completed and complemented each other very well uh, in terms of uh, perspectives on this important joint report. Uh, among the, the, the examples you provided were some examples uh, that were African in nature. And uh, that, that helped me in terms of segueing into the next presentation and the importance of regional approaches when it comes to uh, seizing the opportunities and minimizing the drawbacks that are connected with this important topic. And I'm happy now to give the floor to uh, an online speaker uh, Mr. Tariq Iziraren, who's the Permanent Secretary of the African Athletic States Process, and he'll be speaking about that. Mr. Iziraren, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Ayman. Can you hear me? So, I'm really Yes, we can hear. You're, you're a bit low, uh, but we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I'm really happy to be part of this discussion. I would have loved to be with you, but uh, I think we have technology that allows us to, to be connected, but most importantly is that they don't have to fly, which is good, I think, for nature, climate, and earth. So my task today would be to introduce the African Atlantic State process, known by its acronym ASP. This is a, a, a African Partnership Initiative launched in uh, 2022 uh, in about uh, Morocco. Uh, it's a uh, with the, with the main objective to, to, to achieve shared prosperity and, uh, and stability, it has a very broad mandate. It's underpinned by three pillars. Uh, and I'd like to insist on, 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 the, on the notion of integration of the three pillars. I will come to that uh, later on. Uh, but I think most importantly, what I try to show you today that 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 this this initiative or partnership initiative African partnership initiative could be among the frameworks that could promote uh, nature nature based solutions for sustainable development, uh, biodiversity conservation and, and, and climate resistant, uh, resilience, because the fact is that there is a lot, there are a lot of demand with regard to infrastructure development, economic growth, employment creation, especially for youth. But the questions remain that in how we can achieve that while at the same time uh, preserving our nature, uh, conserving the biodiversity and making sure that we are not contributing to uh, worsening of, of the phenomena of climate change. So this is the question and this is at the center of what we are trying to do, but let me also highlight that that sustainability, the notion of sustainability is at the heart of the work we are trying to do in this initiative. I would appreciate if you can please move to the next slide. So this is our final presentation. I will try to run very quickly on, on, on the slide. I will talk about leadership and vision, institutional framework, the interlinked pillars of the African Atlantic State Partnership, the importance of cooperation, the area of sustainable development, protection environment, and the objective of the initiative of this initiative, especially with regard to the, 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 the topic of this discussion. So can we move on to the next slide? So what you see here on this slide is a screenshot from our website, because a partnership initiative like this one requires uh, strong leadership at the highest political level, a clear vision, because this is how we can achieve the goals of this initiative. And when it comes to this initiative, His Majesty the King Mohammed VI was the one who provided this leadership and vision. He called for the establishment of this initiative. And just uh, recently, in November of last year, he called also for strengthening this leadership that could not only, only uh, bring positive uh, uh, impact on the sustainable development of the 20, 23 countries bordering the Atlantic, but also other parts of Africa. The text that you see on the screen is, is from a meeting in Rabat in 28 June of 2022, in which the, the ministers recognized the commitment of His Majesty King Mohammed thinks in order to promote this initiative. And, and to make it to make it a relevant one 
for the sustainable development in Africa because His Majesty King Ahmed VI has always advocated for a more integrated Africa, Africa that has trust in Africa, how African countries can put their effort together in order, in order to achieve their sustainable development goals. But let me say also that the value proposition of this initiative is to foster collective leadership and ownership because it's really important, because this is a really a paramount in order to make sure that initiatives like this one are successful. So if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, so the association of homework, I will go very quickly on this one because as I mentioned, this is an initiative that brings together 20 African countries border the Atlantic with the objective to promote and foster shared prosperity and stability in the region. So far, we, we have had three ministerial meetings we have adopted a program of action, and also the way we are we are structured, we have the ministerial meeting, which is which is the decision maker body of this initiative. We have created three thematic groups on the three pillars. So I will talk about that in the next slide, and then we have a secretariat which is based in Rabat. So I will move to the next slide, and here I am talking about the three pillars that really end up in this partnership. Uh, we are trying to, to, to tackle the three pillars in a, in a way that is very holistic uh, because if you look at even at the SDGs, this, all the Simitin SDGs are the interlinked and this is the way we are trying to do it with the Gartner's initiative. We have the first one is about, about political and security dialogue. But when we are talking about political and security dialogue, we are focusing more in some of the obstacles of development in Africa. We are talking about the fight against terrorism, maritime piracy, international organized crime. And then we have the second pillar, which is the blue economy, maritime connectivity and energy, focusing on some economic aspect. And the third one is about sustainable development and environment. And why I highlighted the notion of and the, and the linkages and the connection and the connection that exists between all these pillars because it's really important to highlight that what, while looking at one pillar, we can take anyone, for example, fight against terrorism and, and international organized crime. So let's say the security responses, even if they are really important, they are not enough because it's really important to look on how we can do our economy, how we can create jobs, especially for youth, because this is the way how we can prevent youth and, 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 and people to, to, be, to, 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 to be diverted to illegal, 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 uh, illegal activities. And at the same time, we have to make sure whatever we do in, in the economic realm will not also impact our nature or our environment. So the reason why, as I, as I highlighted at the beginning, it's really important to look at the three pillars in an integrated way, but how this partnership initiative uh, initiative could be among the, the framework to promote and foster nature-based solutions for, 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 for biodiversity conservation and also climate resilience. If we can move to the next slide. So here I am just trying to put some of the elements that and some data that would show how important is the initiative for the African, the African countries that are involved, because we are talking about around half of the population, almost also half of the GDP of Africa, half of the continental trade. We have like uh, around 15,000 kilometers of, co of uh, coastline that is very endowed with a lot of natural resources, including energy. And you may have heard about the, the project of the gas pipeline from Nigeria to Morocco. Uh, but at the same time, this coastline is really uh, provides significant sources for economic activities, food security, energy, employment, and livelihood, which is really important. This is also what I try to convey to you as a message, because there are a lot of demands when it comes to, to how to grow, because it's really important to grow our economies, to make sure to provide you jobs and livelihood to people, especially, especially for, for youth. But at the same time, we know that all this activity will impact our nature, will impact 
the health of the ocean, the biodiversity in the ocean. So, and how we can make sure that whatever approach we are having is about a balanced one. So I have just, and you know better than me, that for example, oceans absorb 25% of the state two emissions. And the ocean can play an important role as, as a buffer against climate change. But at the same time, these emissions can jeopardize the ability of the ocean to absorb this, this, this CO2. So it's really important to look at, at this aspect in a very in a very holistic way. So what I have listed there, and I mentioned about the program of action, is that what I mentioned earlier about the program of action that we 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 adopted last year in July by the minister adopted this program. And this is some of the actions that we are trying to put forward. I, I don't put all of the 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 the, the options that we are trying to 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 implement in order to 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 promote uh, the pres preservation of the biodiversity and 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 to and also to make sure that we are not impacting our climate. So one of them, and I think it's very relevant when it comes to education, how we can promote education in this area is about ocean literacy and civic awareness for the preservation of marine areas and biodiversity. There are so many other aspects related to, to how we make sure to, to address the greenhouse gas emissions from international shipping, because one of the objectives of this initiative, for example, is how we can how we can increase interregional trade among the African countries, how at the same time we can improve the capacities of the African countries in, 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 in preserving the biodiversity in main areas and so on and so forth. So, so we, we, as I highlighted at the beginning, it's, a, it's much broader uh, uh, the mandate of this initiative about broader in scope, and we are trying to look at all these aspects in a very holistic way because we do uh, uh, think and we do understand that so many other objectives are very legitimate, especially when it comes, especially in the African context, in terms of economic growth, job creation, and especially for youth. So if we can move to the next slide. So this is my last slide, and I'm just trying to summarize what are the objectives of this initiative. As I, I, I said before, so what we are trying to put forward is a holistic vision of cooperation with the Atlantic. And this is the first time that we have a vision of cooperation in this part of, of Africa. We know that there are so many other initiatives that are put forward by other countries and other regions in the world. But it's really important that we, as Africans, were able to define our own priorities, our, our objectives, because we know that the potential is really very huge, but at the same time, we know that the, the challenges are really very, very important. The reason why it's important for us and Africans to pull our effort together in order to look for opportunities of cooperation, but at the same time, to, to face collectively these this, this challenges. And as I said before, we are looking at the three pillars in a very integrated way. It's a, it's a framework to work collectively towards sustainable development, the preservation of the ocean and its resources, because this is the way how we can make sure that, 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 uh, that the oceans will, will, will serve our development in the long run. But at the same time, it's really important to, to, to emphasize that coordination is also at the part of the work we are trying to do, and the Secretary is trying to put every effort in order to coordinate the effort of all countries uh, that are involved in this partnership, is to coordinate our actions, but at the same time to coordinate our position with the international organization organizations because it's really important to highlight the fact that that international organizations are the ones that are sitting the rules at the international level. The reason why as Africans it's important for us to speak with one voice because this is the way how we can influence these processes and processes in a, in a way that that could also serve the, our objectives. 
And the last point that I'd like to share with you is that this initiative, partnership initiative, is all to get to a partnership not only within the continent but also with external partners, because we know that the challenges in 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 in, in the the Atlantic Oceans no no borders. There is no way we can tackle these challenges and and till we we bring our effort together, we put our effort together in order to be much more effective in the way how we are tackling these challenges. So the main message that I'm trying to convey to you is that this African Partnership Initiative could be among the frameworks that could promote nature-based uh, solutions for sustainable development, the conservation of biodiversity and climate resilience, and the way we are trying to do it is a partnership uh, with not only the African uh, other African initiative, but also with external partners and including next nations. So uh, thank you very much once again for the kind of invitation and looking forward to the discussions and hope to have uh, and the interaction with the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll, um, now, in, the, uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to invite the next speakers to be as uh, efficient as possible in terms of sharing their perspectives and views. Uh, so now we move on to a different uh, aspect of our commitment that is very dear to the heart of the foundation at the core of our activities, which is environmental education. Uh, we'll have uh, three speakers, and actually I would like to acknowledge some of our partners that are in the room that are working uh, across the globe in terms of environmental education. Thank you very much for, for being with us uh, in that context. So we have somebody from the Foundation for Environmental Education that is connected online, Ms. Lee Ray Davis, who's the Global Director for Education at said foundation and a dear partner of the foundation. And will be followed by a testimony from a young reporter for the environment who's connected from Morocco. And then finally, a concrete case study, very short by a colleague of mine, but that has been coordinating this whole event, Ms. Kautar Qaidi. Without further ado, Ms. Ray Davis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think if my I have a slide presentation to come up um, and just while we're waiting for that to um, load, um, I would just like to introduce if you haven't already heard of us, we are the Foundation for Environmental Education. We are one of the largest educational um, programs in the world. And um, I think if it's possible just to bring the presentation up and then we've got some stats and some numbers um, that we can then share with you, if that's possible, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you just go on to the um, next slide, please. Thank you. And I think it's what's important here to also know is that as I talk to you here about the work that we've been doing at the Environmental Education um, Foundation, I'm actually talking to you having also been a teacher um, for nearly 16 years working on environmental education programs. So FEE, we have, you can see the distribution on the map here, 104 member organizations across 83 countries, and we run five programs. Our three core education programs that I'll speak to you about today are uh, the Eco Schools program, learning about forests, uh, young reporters for the environment. But we also, and I'm sure some of you will have definitely have heard of before, we have our Blue Flag Award for Beaches and Green Key Award for Hotels. And we've been working on these programmes now combined for about 40 years um, with a focus on sustainable um, development. And I think it was quite interesting, Michelle said earlier before, we need to do something. This is what we've noticed for the past 40 years has been happening. So if we can go to the next slide, please. I'll just give you um, a little bit more of an overview of what, what we do. So you can see here at the top on this image, rather than the text, I'd like to speak about the images. We have young people. Young people are the heart of the programme. And I'm trying to go through my presentation quite quickly because I want you to hear directly from one of our young reporters for the environment. So the heart of everything that we do is the youth voice and it's the youth voice that's leading these solutions for our main principles, our Gaia principles, which are climate action, environmental pollution and global biodiversity. 
But not only that, we work at an international level as well, working with policies and governments and development levels to help these young people's voices be heard. And then down at the bottom, last but not least as well, we don't just work with the young people at the level, we have to bridge that gap. And that's where we're working directly with the educators, whose role it is to deliver quality education, but at the same time embed the importance of climate action, climate resilience and biodiversity loss. So next panel, uh, next slide, please. So just some numbers, we're actually celebrating a 30th anniversary of our Eco Schools and YRE programmes this year. Um, and again, coming back to something Michelle said earlier about this fundamental value change, this is what we're seeing through these programmes. It is working right down. We've had a generation of actions that have been taking place in the classroom, spilling out into communities and to families. And so our Eco Schools programme is holistic. It's not just individuals within the school. It's the whole school taking the process. And we have the Eco Schools programme running in 102 countries, and that includes international schools from around the world who might not have a, a member organisation running that programme. We have roughly um, just over 49,600 schools and 40 million learners. And this is currently, as I speak to you over at this moment in time. Our other um, programme, the Young Reporters for the Environment programme, is actually, OK, it's a journalism programme, but it also fosters and helps develop youth leadership through positive storytelling and positive climate actions. And with that programme, again, in its 30th year in 43 countries, with over 300,000 learners and we have an annual competition where on average we will get close to 23,000 young uh, journalists sending us in articles, photographs, video reportage um, to us about um, environmental issues in their areas. And then finally, the next slide, please. The third programme that we have to help foster this environmental education within schools um, very specifically with nature and connections with nature is our learning about for, uh, learning about ecosystems and forest program. So we have actually, as of yesterday, you're hearing it here first, amended the program so that the title ecosystems is now in the name rather than just forest because we believe it's extremely important. A lot of people were just focusing on forests as in deciduous or coniferous woodlands. And it was interesting to hear before about mangroves and peatlands and savannas. That's what we're now uh, encouraging our educators and young people to work on and to connect with. And this is a programme that's running in 29 countries with just short of 4,000 schools and again, seven, just short of 700,000 learners. Um, and I think it was interesting before Philip mentioned about bioeconomy. I just wanted to flag up that as part of the LEAF programme and some of the other work that we're doing, we are working on three European projects called BioBio and GenV, which is about fostering bioeconomy and five pillows of, of bioeconomy that we can uh, work with young people on that cover all elements and all services within ecosystems. Uh, next slide, please. And so also important to know in terms of the bigger picture of the work that we're doing. So the Eco Schools programme itself and FEE is the co-lead of Pillar 1 on the Greening Schools um, uh, Greening Education Partnership. And with a view that we are aiming for 50 percent of schools to be operating sustainably by 2030. And then in to do specifically with ecosystems restoration, um, FEE is one of the lead partners on the UA decade for the education challenge, specifically education, uh, regist uh, edu um, sorry, environmental ecosystems restoration education. And again, that's not just working within formal education settings, but also non-formal education settings as well. So next slide, please. I'm going to give a very brief overview of these programmes. I don't want to take up too much time because I do want to pass over to a, one of the our young reporters to speak to you. I would actively encourage you all, though, to please visit our websites um, and you can see that we have 30 years uh, or 25 years of uh, eco schools activity, leaf activity and inspiration to um, to take from there. So just as a basic overview, how is it working and, and how is the eco schools program actually 
working as a holistic program within the schools. So the Eco Schools program is a seven step framework. We ask young people from early years right through to university level. So we've now expanded to eco campuses to work through the seven step framework where they will form an eco committee. They will audit their own school and it's up to them to audit their school. They will come up with an action plan based on various environmental topics that are important to them. They will then, working with the teachers, look for where there is environmental education within the curriculum and not just the obvious curriculum areas that might include science and technology, but art and creativity and music as well. And then it's about reaching out into the wider community and getting parents, local businesses, local organisations engaged in the eco schools work and the environmental actions that the young people have planned and communicating what it is their goals and objectives are. And then we also ask the young people to monitor their work. There's a resilience and a growth mindset. If their ideas and their actions don't work, why that isn't a bad thing, how they can learn from that, how they can expand from that and how they can do things differently. And then finally, we ask them to come up with their own eco ethic or eco um, code, which is their um, kind of mission statement for their school. And once they have all of their things, the schools can apply for the international eco schools green flag. And it doesn't matter if you are a green flag school in Nairobi or in Manchester, where I'm based in the UK, it is the same flag and all of our teachers, all of our young people are working through those same steps together and collectively to make a difference. And then if we move on to the next slide, please, our uh, other programme that we have is the Young Reporters for the Environment. So the Young Reporters for the Environment is very much an individual student program. We have teachers that help facilitate it, but for that reason, it isn't just uh, a formal education setting program. It is non-formal. We're working with the World Scout organization movement. We have youth groups and climate groups who are working on the Young Reporters for the Environment program. And here, what we ask young people to do is actually to develop transferable life skills, not just for environmental action, but to help them develop skills that might also then lead on to a career in the green environmental sector. Yes, maybe in journalism, but also in local entrepreneurship, local government and local business. And so we ask the young people to investigate an issue that is important to them. We ask them to research it with an unbiased manner and find out the causes and the effects of this particular problem. And then we then ask them to think of an appropriate manner in which they want to report their findings to the local community or even nationally, and then how they will disseminate that to ensure that as many people as possible are able to hear about their work they're doing and help them take action. And just on the right hand side here is actually a photograph. It's one of the winning photographs because we do hold an international competition for our young journalists. Um, and this here is the winning photograph taken from a by a young person in uh, Mexico. And I don't know if you can see here clearly on the screen, it was raising awareness of drought in uh, northern Mexico. And it is the same area, the same river or wadi. And you can see it was lush and green and water flowing through but by the next year, it was a completely different picture. And it was the same tree and the young person had written this article to go alongside that particular photograph for the impact it was having on them. And the other as well, we mentioned before the eco schools and we're supporting JET Pillar 1, but we are also through the Young Reporters for the Environment supporting community cohesion through the Young Reporters for the Environment programme, which is JEP Pillar 4, as we ask young people to work with local leaders, um, uh, local uh, religious groups, local um, businesses and so on to help them disseminate their environmental message. And then our final education programme, if you could go to the next slide, please, learning about the environment and forest. Um, this one is really about hands on outdoor learning, connecting with nature and helping young people to really develop that passion to want to protect their outdoor environments and instill this sense of ownership. And 
this rekindling of wonderment, not just of forests, but ecosystems. As I said before, we've expanded this as of yesterday. And they work, the young people work through four pedagogical stages when they work on the LEAF Award. They are looking at what's around them. They are exploring what's around them. They are investigating what's around them and they are flourishing with what's around them as well. And we hoping that, that well, through the LEAF programme, which is in its 25th year, it's slightly younger, um, is inspiring nature-based solutions of how human activities can positively interact with services. Um, and I've just put here on the left hand side as well. And through this and through all of our programmes, I do invite you to, if you know, we are running actually an international teacher award to highlight and put the spotlight on educators who are helping with nature based learning and presentation. And if we can go on to um, the last slide, please. Uh, I would pass over now to our young reporters for the environment student. I don't want to keep any longer, but we will be sharing these slides with you. Please, as I said before, do head over to our websites. There is an absolute wealth of inspiration out there for climate, climate resilience, uh, climate adaptation, nature and ecosystems restoration, um, education experiences on all of the websites from teachers from across the globe with varying levels of skill, um, experience and income that are implementing very, very impactful um, activities. I've put my contact details on here as well. If you would like to find more about how you can get involved, please do. We welcome. The only way we can make a difference is if we connect and we work together. And with that, I'd like to pass over to one of our YRE students to give you their perspective on the Young Reporters for the Environment programme. Um, hello everyone, thank you Ms Lee. Um, greetings everyone, my name is Bushay Tashet. I am a proud Moroccan young reporter at the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection under the presidency of Her Royal Highness Princess Al Hasna. And I'm beyond honored to be a part of this most remarkable event. Well, I just wanted to express actually my absolute gratitude for the world and for my country and all of the improvements made in the environmental field and the determination to make the world a better place, not just for us, but for generations to come. No one can deny the fact that youth is actually so important. Matter of fact, we are the new men and women of the future, and we have so many responsibilities towards the environment and our nature. And it is crystal clear that Morocco is a country that actually cares for the Moroccan youth and believe and invest in their potential. Under the leadership of His Majesty King Mohammed VI, may God grant him victory. Taking as an example the YRE exam, the Young Reporter for the Environment ex um, program that the Mohammed VI Foundation adopted since 2003. In my case, I had the absolute honor to represent my country as a delegate, as a YRE, with the Mohammed VI Foundation at the WEEK, which is the World Environmental Education Congress, and the YEEK. Youth Environmental Education Congress last month in its 12th edition held in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates under the theme Connecting People, Creating Tomorrow, where I got the chance to meet people from all around the world, from different backgrounds and nationalities, and that is to discuss many environmental issues, and one of them was climate change and biodiversity. Nowadays, we are facing many problems, and it is our duty to find solutions to, solutions to these hazardous issues, considering the fact that biodiversity is what facing many threats, like climate change, pollution, overexploitation, etc. And our biodiversity is what makes our world a life. Lastly, I would very much like to end my little speech with a poem I wrote about biodiversity and our mother nature. In various fields will life thus bloom, a place of wonder, beauty, oh, Mother Earth, our home we assume, a place of wonder, beauty, and might, her love and care, a consistent light, her skies of blues, her oceans wide, the creators she nurtures far and wide, yet we've caused her pain, our actions dire, polluted skies, forests aspire. Oh, let us change our ways, take heed, for Mother Earth, our hearts should heat. Protect her lands, her air, her sea. In harmony, let us all be. Together, we can make a stand to heal the earth, our common land. 
We of love and care will set things right. For Mother Earth, we must all fight. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you liked my poem. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, beautiful note of poetry and uh, last speaker I'd like to ask for the understanding of the next section we started ourselves uh, unfortunately delayed we try our best to absorb that uh, last speaker will be my colleague Ms. Kautar Qaidi who's junior product manager of the safeguarding and development of the Marrakesh Palm Grove program at the foundation uh, Kautar the floor is yours thank you please be as brief as possible a lot of deference to the, 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 the next presentations thank you uh, thank you, Mr. Shalkhar, for the introduction. Uh, so uh, today I'm presenting uh, the Safeguarding and Development Program of the Pan Group of Marrakesh. Uh, I am Qatar Qaidi, the Junior Project Manager of the Safeguarding and Development uh, of the Pan Group of Marrakesh Program within the Mohammed VI Foundation of Environmental Protection, uh, which is uh, chaired by Her Royal Highness, uh, Princess Lala Hasna. So uh, this is one of the programs of the um, Foundation Mohammed VI for Environmental Protection, uh, which it, which was um, uh, which was uh, classified in uh, 1929 uh, as a pro protected site uh, by a Royal Dahir in recognition of its landscape, cultural, and historical values. Uh, His Majesty King Mohammed VI entrusted Her Royal Highness Princess Lala Hasna. Uh, in 2005 with the mission of uh, mobilizing uh, numerous actors and, and partners to initiate the conservation and development of the Palm Grove of Marrakesh and the effective launch of this program took place on March 2007 in Marrakesh. So the program uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, has a series of uh, sub subcomponents which are consisting in uh, planting under, under the voluntary carbon uh, offsetting program, uh, the maintenance and watering of plant planted areas, and also uh, watering with purified wastewater, uh, supporting family farms in the practice of agroecology, and then uh, the, the the efforts of the the Hassan II uh, International C Center for Environmental uh, Training in uh, raising awareness and educational uh, uh, environmental education actions. So, for the key achievements of the program, we have the densification of the palm grove. Uh, with uh, more than uh, 620,000 palm trees, uh, which is uh, 5,000 uh, 5, palm trees uh, planted uh, every year. Uh, we, also, we are also uh, watering the northwest palm grove with purified wastewater. And uh, we are also uh, uh, including uh, the Northeast uh, Palm Grove uh, with a project uh, which uh, started in 2023. We are also focusing on rehabilitating uh, 580 hectares of restructured palm grove. And uh, we are also uh, uh, planning and uh, working on uh, on uh, on a perspective of um, uh, helping agricultural cooperative and the uh, creation of uh, of a northwest palm grove uh, which uh, it, it, sorry uh, we are also uh, focusing on uh, helping the cooperative to 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 uh, to work on the uh, 91 hectares of land developed in agroecology we initiated in 2014 the classification of the site of biological and ecological interest of the margins of the palm grove of Marrakesh. Uh, uh, and also, uh, we are also extensive, uh, extending, extending uh, awareness and training programs through eco schools in the nine palm grove schools uh, of the palm grove of Marrakesh. Uh, we launched uh, in uh, 2022. Uh, a survey uh, uh, of the entire palm grove, which which is consisting in uh, twelve thousand hectares of the palm grove, and this is what uh, the twelve twelve thousand hectares uh, look like looks like. And then, what is new uh, in the program uh, is a new ecosystem approach uh, for the sustainable management of the palm grove of Marrakesh. 
which is based on two strategic axes, uh, which are uh, an inventory and diagnosis of the ecosystem, which, which is leading to a roadmap for the implementation and achievements of the objectives defined in the selected uh, development scenario. So I will end with uh, the, the key uh, development uh, projects, which are uh, rehabilitating, regenerating, and maintaining of the palm grove ecosystem, the reinforcement of planting actions by introducing carob and acacia species, continuing the preparation for the site of ecological and biological interest class classification, the empowerment uh, initiatives uh, for local farming communities, and finally, the strengthening uh, of the education, awareness raising, and communication efforts on the program. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we, we had planned for a QA. and a Unfortunately, there will be no time for that. However, uh, please get in touch if you have any questions. We apologize. We need to respect the session that comes after us, uh, despite the fact that we ourselves were significantly delayed. I would like to thank the uh, speakers, all of them, our partners that engaged. Thank you so much for, for your engagement in this. Thank you to all of you. I remain, um, my, 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 my throat is a bit dry because I would have been very happy to hear and be, have the water of your, of your contributions, but unfortunately, uh, it would have to remain dry at this point. And thank you again to all of you for engaging with us. Thank you.